What do you know about a man called Scaramanga, 007? Scaramanga? Oh, yes. The man with the golden gun. The Man with the Golden Gun had not been as successful as previous Bond films had been. It was by no means a failure, but it wasn't as grand and at the top of the ladder as the Bond movies of the 60s had been. And the one's golden partnership between Saltzman and Broccoli wasn't what it used to be either. There was some friction between the two and plus Saltzman had some financial problems as well. Ultimately it resulted in Saltzman's departure, selling all his shares of E.ON and leaving Cobby Broccoli as the sole producer of the Bond franchise. The franchise needed a major comeback or it could mean the end of it all. The fate of Bond was resting on Cobby Broccoli's shoulders. The Spy Who Loved Me was the title chosen for the next Bond film. Fleming didn't sell the rights to the original novel as he wasn't proud of that one supposedly so only the title would be used. So the story was going to be a completely original one for the very first time. The filmmakers originally wanted to bring back Blofeld as the main villain for this movie. However Kevin McClory, the guy that owned the rights to Thunderbolt and now also to Blofeld, forced an injunction on Eon Productions so that didn't happen. So the movie was even delayed another year because of this. Finding a director for the movie also brought difficulties with it. Guy Hamilton, who directed the previous three and Goldfinger, was now out. There were even stories of plans to bring in Steven Spielberg at some point, but supposedly he wanted too much creative control. Eventually, Lewis Gilbert, who had previously directed You Only Live Twice, was brought back. It was truly a make it or break it situation for Cobby Broccoli and the franchise, so how does 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me hold up in retrospect? <laughs> Due to an aspect ratio change back to a wider screen, a new gun barrel was shot. And some small trivia here, this was the first gun barrel in the series to feature Bond in his tuxedo. The story starts out with a British nuclear submarine. The crew is enjoying their usual underwater business when shit kicks off. It's not explained what is happening to the submarine, but we just get some alarms going off, things shaking and the crew being in horror and saying stuff like, oh my god. Oh my god. Then the movie moves us to the HQ of the KGB in Moscow, where we are introduced to the head of the KGB, General Gogo, who is the Russian equivalent of M. And he even has a secretary by the name of Miss Rubelfitch, which I always thought was a funny joke. It is revealed that a Russian submarine has experienced similar problems as their sub has gone missing. So General Gogol decides to put their best agent on the job, Agent Triple X. And the movie tricks you into believing that the guy is Triple X, but it's actually the chick, Anya Omasova, played by Barbara Bach. And her boyfriend is also a Russian agent who is sent out to Austria. Meanwhile in London, M is informed that the British submarine has disappeared too, and he also says he will get their best agent on the job. So we move to Agent 007, who is just concluding his mission in Austria. He gets the message from M on his watch in typical Roger Moore Bond film fashion. So he just leaves his chick and puts on this overly striking bright yellow ski outfit armed with a huge red backpack, which is another thing you would only see Roger Moore's Bond wear. So Bond skis away in Austria and some bad guys appear and we get a great action scene. Bond is doing amazing stunts and the music in the background by the way is ridiculously cool. It's like really 70s funky stuff. It's, look up Bond 77, it's a great track. The score of this movie by the way isn't done by John Barry but by Marvin Hamlish and whenever someone else does it for a change I usually find it very refreshing. Bond shoots down one of the bad guys which happens to be the Russian boyfriend of Triple X and then the scene comes to an amazing climax.
I mean, even to this day, I still find this stunt to be absolutely amazing. On the world premiere of this movie, it got a standing ovation and even Prince Charles was reported of standing up and applauding. It's easily the most brilliant and iconic pre-title sequence the franchise have had up until this point in the series. It symbolized exactly where the franchise was at at this point. Just taking enormous risks, flying into the abyss and then proudly presenting itself again. Bond was back with a bang. And then we get the opening titles, and we get a very iconic Bond song here, performed by Carly Simon. And it's one of those songs I usually like to listen to whenever I've passed an exam, or, you know, whenever I felt I gave my girlfriend a great night. Nobody does it better Makes me feel sad After the titles, Anya Omasova is given her mission, which is to find out what happened to the Russian submarine, and she gets a lead in Cairo. She's also informed that her boyfriend has been killed. Meanwhile, Bond is about to receive his mission, and he is in his naval uniform, which we haven't seen since he only lived twice. Maybe director Lewis Gilbert had a thing with those uniforms or something. So Bond meets up with Q, the Minister of Defense, an admiral and some other British officials and it's basically explained that somebody knew the course of the submarine and can track them down by their wake. So just like Anya Omasafa, Bond is sent out to Egypt to find out more about the submarine disappearance because in Egypt there apparently is a market for a submarine tracking system and so the plot kicks off. And then we are introduced to our main villain, Carl Stromberg, played by Kurt Jurgens, and he immediately gets to do typical Bond villain stuff. Sit behind a desk, talking to scientists which have served him, and pressing buttons to open trap doors and slide people into shark tanks. It was you who betrayed me. You had access to all the information. Now you will pay the penalty. The scientists are also killed with the press of a button, so Stromberg is your average sit-behind-the-desk megalomaniac Bond villain, and it's easy to see Stromberg could have just as easily been Blofeld, but Stromberg happens to be a villain in love with the underwater world, as he also has webbed fingers and his lair is actually this really cool underwater base, the Atlantis. <laughs> It's not Stromberg, however, who is the particularly memorable villain of this movie, but one of his two henchmen is, the infamous and iconic Jaws, played by Richard Kiel, who has metal teeth and has haunted the dreams of generations of little kids all around the world. So Bond is in Egypt, a first time for the series to see Bond in Africa. He meets with his contact there and he learns a guy named Max Kalba has a microfilm which has the info about the submarine tracking system on it. But before he can meet Kalba, he first needs to meet a middleman by the name of Fakish. But not before getting accustomed to Egypt's culture. Are you, uh... Quite sure I can't persuade you to stay the night. When one is in Egypt, one should delve deeply into its treasures. So Bond goes to meet the middleman Fakis at his apartment and encounters a girl who obviously is there to distract him. But Bond just rolls with it anyway and when he's about to get shot he just uses the girl to catch the bullet. Because, you know, ladies first. And then he runs after the shootist who is one of Stromberg's henchmen, Sanders. And there's a small little fight between him and Bond on the rooftop. Which is okay, but nothing spectacular. Where's Fakis? Pyramids! What a helpful chap. So off Bond goes to the pyramids, where there is this show going on. Fekas is there in the crowd together with Anya Omasafa, who obviously is also there after the microfilm because she has the same mission as Bond, and Jaws is hiding out in the shadows. Fekas then spots Jaws, and like every normal human being, Jaws scares the shit out of him, so he runs off and tries to keep safe by locking himself into a tomb. But it's Jaws, man. The guy just bites his way through and takes his time as he approaches you slowly and hunts your dreams. I mean, the good man is over 2 meters long. You know, 7 foot 1.5. The guy's a giant. So, Fekas is bitten to death and when Bond finds Fekas' body, he discovers where he can find Max Kelba, the guy who has the microfilm. 
So Bond goes over to this fancy place wearing a really badly aged tuxedo with like oversized trousers and huge collars. I mean, the fashion of the 70s hasn't aged well. Anya is also there wearing a much better aged dress and the two reveal they both did their homework on each other. Commander James Bond, recruited to the British Secret Service from the Royal Navy, licensed to kill and has done so on numerous occasions. Many lady friends, but married only once. Wife killed All right, you've made your point. And I really like the bit where Bond gets all sentimental about his wife, not playing it for the jokes, but being more serious about that. It's the first time since we got to see the killing of Bond's wives in Majesties that this is actually mentioned, and I'm glad Moore decided to put some rare emotion into this small little bit. Anyway, Bond and Anya are both after the microfilm that Max Calva has, but much like Fekish, he is also bitten to death by Jaws and the microfilm is stolen by him. So Bond and Anya sneak into the back of the van that Jaws drives and they are taken to these ruins where Jaws runs off. And there is some tension built in finding Jaws and eventually getting the microfilm and running off together. It is here where some great fun between Bond and Anya starts. They both received the same mission from their own respective countries countries, so they are constantly competing with each other in a playful way. Try the big one. Women drivers. Shaken, but not stirred. And I find it to be a lot of fun to actually watch a Bond girl be Bond's equal for a change, which arguably happened for the first time in this film. The cylinder head gasket. Oh. And Roger Moore is just great as Bond in this movie. He truly made the role his own by the time of this film and you can tell that he grew really confident and comfortable with it. Jaws is great in this scene too, ripping open the fan, trying to get back to microfilm and also being a bit cartoony and stupid, but it's all part of the fun. Bond and Anya run off to a boat and the theme of Bond and Anya constantly outwitting each other all the time continues as Bond sneakily examines the microfilm on the boat and Anya knocking Bond out with a gas to steal the microfilm when it seemingly gets romantic. So the next day Bond heads to another covert MI6 HQ in Egypt. Of course Moneypenny is in there and there's the usual gags with the Q lab and all that but it's revealed that General Gogol and Anya are also there and that's because it's decided that the KGB and MI6 should team up for this mission. So they all examine the microfilm and the vital information is taken out but they do discover that there is a logo of Stromberg Laboratories on there and that is on Sardinia. So that is where Bond and Anya, who are now officially teamed up, need to go next. And everybody with a little geographical knowledge knows that Egypt is here and Sardinia is an Italian island over here. So how do Bond and Anya travel there? By plane? Or maybe by boat? No, they take the train. Why the hell would you take a train to an island? I I'm sure it can be explained and all that, but when you really think about it, it's just an excuse for the filmmakers to have a train scene. But train scenes are usually good in Bond films and this one is no exception. Besides, Anya is looking smoking hot in that sleeping dress she's wearing, so I've already forgotten that they're on a train to an island by then. Once again, Jaws manages to provoke a global pants crap fest, but man, he's just great, isn't he? So a fight starts between Jaws and Bond, and it's a pretty good one. I mean, Jaws is a beast. His hands alone look like they could squish Bond's head, and he's just so creepy. Bond looks in actual danger here. I wouldn't call this fight better than the one with Red Grant in From Russia With Love, but I do feel it's the better one than the one with Teehee in Live and Let Die. The moment where Bond manages to get Jaws by electrocuting his teeth, however, is a bit weird. Hold still, Jaws. I'm about to electrocute your teeth. Any minute now. Hold on. Oh, oh there it is. I mean, it's like Jaws wants him to do that. He, he doesn't do anything to prevent it from happening. And then he's just kicked out of the window and Jaws being Jaws, he obviously survives everything, but that does give him this really indestructible quality. And after the fight, Bond finally gets to bang Anya. Why don't you lie down and let me look at it?
and the jazzy music going with it, it's really cheesy and all, but come on, Bond saved her life, and the movie is already on the halfway point here, he really deserved to get it on. When Bond and Anya arrive on Sardinia, Q shows up with Bond's new car, the Lotus Esprit, which is easily one of my favorite cars in the franchise. And the cool thing about it is that Q is giving Bond the instructions on the gadget in a distance, so we don't actually get to hear what the car does before it happens. Anyway, Bond is now posing as a marine biologist interested in Stromberg Laboratories, and he and Anya are picked up by a beautiful henchwoman of Stromberg, Naomi. There is some funny flirting between Bond and Naomi, which really annoys Anya, and it actually always makes me smile. It's like when you're chatting to a beautiful girl whenever your girlfriend is right next to you. This stuff is just bound to happen. This way. Thank you. Now, uh, don't be a bother to Naomi, darling. I'll be back soon. So Bond meets up with the villain Stromberg and there's some casual talking and Stromberg asking Bond about fishes and Bond happens to actually come off as an expert on the subject which is quite surprising but the most important discovery they make here is that they find out Stromberg has a huge super tanker the Lipperus which apparently has never docked somewhere before. But Stromberg of course already knows that they are secret agents from the British Secret Service and the KGB, so he orders Jaws to kill them when they get back ashore. So here some action kicks in as Bond and Anya are in the Lotus and some of Stromberg's goons show up, and it's easily my favorite action scene in this movie. The motorbike shooting away the motorcycle car like a rocket is really inventive and extremely entertaining. And so is Bond using gadgets to shake off Jaws, who of course survives yet another crash. A hell the helicopter piloted by Naomi also shows up in this chase, but the biggest payoff comes when Bond just drives the Lotus into the water and it's revealed that it's a submarine too. I mean, how classic is that? I mean, sure, at this stage of the franchise we're really far away from what Fleming envisioned back in the day, but for a cinematic Bond experience this is just so entertaining. It's weird though how Anya acts all surprised that Bond is about to dive into the water and then five minutes later she tells Bond he already knew about this since he saw the blueprints of the car, and I'm always like, yeah, sure you did. So Bond fires the underwater missile at Naomi, again it's over the top, but it's just so awesome. The action continues underwater as some more goons show up, which Bond shakes off with some underwater gadgets, and they examine the Atlantis base from up close, and they basically find out that Stromberg indeed has a submarine tracking system, thus confirming that he is responsible for the missing of the British and the Russian submarines which we at the audience pretty much already knew, but whatever, it gave Bond an excuse to use his underwater Lotus. And the part where Bond just casually drives up a beach with the badass Bond theme playing in the background and throwing out a fist, it's just hilarious. There's also a drunk guy looking at his bottle, which becomes a reoccurring thing in more movies after this one, and it's a funny gag. Anyway, after all that over-the-top stuff, things do get a little bit more down-to-earth in the hotel room, where Anya discovers that Bond was in Austria and that he killed her boyfriend. Bond is being really honest with her and he admits that this is true, so Anya tells Bond that when the mission is over, she will kill him, which gives this movie a bit of an unexpected turn, but then the moment after that, Anya and Bond are lowered into an American submarine, and I always laugh at Moore's expression here, because it comes up seconds after Anya told him that he would kill him after the mission. And the captain of the American sub is played by Shane Rimmer, which is great because he is the one that voiced Scott Tracy in my favorite childhood show, The Thunderbirds. And he also previously appeared in small roles in You Only Live Twice and Diamonds Are Forever. And I swear, even though he isn't credited, he also voiced that guy witnessing the funeral in Live and Let Die. Whose uh, funeral is it? Yours. I never actually heard anyone ever mention that, but I would recognize his voice everywhere, it's gotta be him. So Bond and Anya are brought into the sub to take a closer look at Stromberg's super tanker, which soon shows up and captures the US submarine anyway, which is a bit implausible, I mean to me it seems the submarine could easily escape such a ship, but whatever, we now know what happened to the Russian and British subs in the beginning of the movie. And the inside of the super tanker is just a great film set, it's huge, they actually had to build the 007 stage at Pinewood Studios, which they still use today, just so that they could house this set. 
So the whole American crew is taken in as prisoners and Stromberg reveals his plan. He launches the other two submarines that have nuclear missiles aboard and he wants to target New York and Moscow with those to provoke a third world war. And if you've watched You Only Live Twice you would know that that film has the exact same plot but there it was apparent that that was the villain's plot much more prominently. Here it's not revealed until the very end of the movie which kept the film feeling very fresh instead of being really redundant. And once the world is in war, Stromberg wants to start a new life under the sea. And he also takes Anya with him, because apparently he also needs a mermaid for his little underwater world. Bond of course escapes and things get really similar to You Only Live Twice here, I've gotta admit, because Bond gets into a monorail system to free the crews of the submarines, much like freeing the astronauts in You Only Live Twice, also with a monorail. Of course a war breaks out between the submarine crews and Stromberg's goons and they are conveniently dressed in red and blue respectively so that we can set them apart. I always really thought that the part where the crew member starts to be all heroic all of a sudden was a bit funny. Leave it to me, sir. <laughs> so yeah. But they can't get into the control room to stop the submarines from blowing up the two cities because of the big wall that separates this room with the control room. So Bond decides to go to one of the nuclear missiles and disable it and use the detonator to blow up the big wall. And it makes for some tense moments where Bond tries to defuse the bomb and writes on the camera in a typical Bond moment and uses the detonator to get to the other side of the super tanker. So Bond and the captain and the crew members storm the control room and Bond finds the submarine tracking system, so he uses it to program the submarines to destroy each other instead of the cities. And Bond and the crew escape in the American sub, you know, before the whole super tanker explodes of course, and the world is saved, a world war is prevented, and the Americans are ordered to destroy Atlantis as well, but Anya is still on Atlantis. Come on Bond, leave the bitch, she wants to kill you anyway when the mission is over. But Bond comes to the rescue in a really badass way. So on board of the Atlantis we get a second climax scene as Bond faces Stromberg who tries to shoot him with a hidden weapon under the table but Bond uses that to his advantage and ultimately kills him in cold blood. It's a cool villain death but the real moment we've been waiting for is the showdown with Jaws and the two fight each other again inside the shark tank room and eventually Bond uses a magnet to dispose of Jaws. I have no clue why there even is a giant magnet hanging in this room at all but whatever. Jaws is dropped into the shark tank and even the sharks don't stand a chance against Jaws, he just bites them to death. And Bond finds Anya who all of a sudden is now dressed in a really sexy dress which apparently Stromberg wanted her to wear or something, but hey I'm not complaining. And the Americans are ordered to destroy Atlantis now but Bond and Anya manage to escape Atlantis into Stromberg's luxurious escape pod. And then comes the moment where Anya wants to kill Bond. The mission is over, Commander. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's not like anything else was to be really expected in a Roger Moore Bond film, but come on, he saved her life twice now, the guy deserves another round. Of course it all ends with a gag of the escape pod floating into a marine ship where Bond and Anya's superiors are all present. Double seven, triple X. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British end up, sir. Nobody does. It doesn't. It's a typical joke for Bond movies from these times to end in this way, but they always leave me with a smile. Baby, you're the best. To me, The Spy Who Loved Me is one of the most James Bond Bond films in the entire series. 
or I should say at least one of the most cinematic James Bond Bond films, because admittedly cars turning into submarines and underwater villain layers appearing in the ocean have little to do with anything Fleming originally envisioned, but for quite some years now the movies have gotten a life of their own, and The Spy Who Loved Me does the entertaining over the top part just so extremely well. It has great girls, exotic locations, a great gadget car, one of the most iconic and memorable henchmen of the series, and the film itself is just so damn fun to watch. I think if Stromberg had been a more memorable main villain as well, it would have been even better. And admittedly, they could have tried to go a bit further with Anya wanting to kill Bond because he killed her boyfriend, but I can see why, for the times, this was just the only way to go with it in the end. Because it needed to bring back Bond with a bang, it needed to not only fulfill the audience's expectations, but blow them completely out of the water. And in that regard, The Spy Who Loved Me succeeded in such a stylish and cool way, that even today I find it to be a top 10 worthy Bond film. A true and classic one. And if you ask me, this is Roger Moore's Goldfinger.